Today on Landline, nature's insurance policy against the deadly Varroa mite. In the tropics, where it's warm enough, definitely. This is 100% could replace honeybees, provided you're worried about pollination and not honey. Legless livestock, the underground enterprise finding favour in farming. The worms are Mother Nature's ultimate recyclers and that's what they've been doing for 450 billion years. And finding peace amidst the pressure of life on the land. I don't know if I could be out here without that creative outlet. Uh, I, I need to be able to express myself. Hello, I'm Pip Courtney. Welcome to the program. Since the discovery of the deadly Varroa mite on Australia's east coast, farmers have been worried about how the impact on honeybees will affect pollination. One Queensland fruit grower is developing an insurance policy by investing in native bees. Here's Landline's Helena Batchkovsky. We've had great wild pollination services, but there were sort of three things that started to make me worry about that. The first one was varroa mite, the second one is habitat loss, and then the last one is fire. And if I never find out what it's like to lose the wild pollinators, that would be just great. But if I do, I've got an insurance policy. Just inland of the Queensland seaside town of Yapoon is a tropical paradise. Fruit trees as far as the eye can see. Owned by the Groves family since the 1960s, this once pineapple farm now plays host to a variety of tropical fruit. They've tried lots of different rare fruits over the years and we've sort of found the ones that work for us and stuck with them. And, and that's mangoes, lychees, avos? Yeah, but also smaller crops like uh, star fruit and, and locusts and jackfruit and dragon fruit and, and things like that. David um, Groves is third generation on farm and while he loves his fruit, there's something else that has captivated his imagination and farming sensibilities. The humble and very small Australian native stingless bees are now some of the hardest workers across their 200 hectares. This one here is full and I just got another empty box. These are beautiful handmade things from down in southeast Queensland and um, I'd like to have another one, so I'm going to split it in half. Do you do that two. here? Yeah. Empty boxes on the table down there. We can go and do it now if you oh, like. OK, I love that. An expert in Australian native bees, Dr Tim Hurd, says stingless bees are very adaptable, taking advantage of whatever plant is around, native or introduced. Honeybees are excellent pollinators. Native stingless bees are excellent pollinators too. Uh, solitary wild bees are also excellent pollinators of many plants, so we need them all. We need diversity. We know that's one of the messages that's coming through in a lot of pollination research these days is it's not about how many visits you get to flowers, it's about the diversity of insects that are visiting those flowers. So if you've got a lot of diversity out there on your farm, uh, a lot of different types of bees and other insects too, then it's much more likely that you will have a better pollination result. They are quite easy to keep. You do need to learn some skills to keep them. You can mess it up pretty badly if you don't know what you're doing, but it's not difficult. It's not brain surgery. An average person can learn to keep these bees with a bit of dedication, a bit of reading, a bit of study, and a lot of practice. Although the bees don't sting, they do bite. And after spraying plenty of bug spray on David's advice, he showed me how to split a hive. You said it's full. What does that mean? How, how full is full? And what's it full of? OK, so there's three layers. The bottom two are where the eggs and the food are, and then the top one, if you allow it to, will be just food, no eggs, and that's if you want to harvest honey. So I'll do this nice and slowly, and then we're going to move up here and get it open, and now we're about to see what's going on inside. Whoa, whoa. Oh, and that is perfect. Wow. So. It's so different to a honey bee hive, yeah. right? Yep. So they're a lot smaller. You can only expect to get a half a kilo or a kilo of honey a year, as opposed to 50 for a European bee. But they don't sting. You're going to have a lot more hives per hectare, and they're better pollinators for small flowers. Is that right? Yeah, they can get into small spaces. So, yeah. hmm. so we're going to put the new empty half on top of the old full half, and um, 
Let them do their just thing. Let them heal. They'll take a little bit of a little bit of repair, a little bit of time. But all things being equal, they should recover pretty quickly. And that works for David and the farm. One example is starfruit and their tiny flowers. With fruit trees not flowering all year, the groves are lucky to have plenty of gums, wattle and native plants flowering within the bee's flight range. But the family also plant flowers on the end of rows and windbreaks. What's the benefit of the native bees rather than the honeybees? They have a much smaller flight radius, so you, depending on where you place them on the farm, you can be guaranteed that they're not leaving the property and not subject to any neighbouring chemical issues or just pollinating trees next door that you don't need done. And what about the fact that they don't get varroa mite? That's a huge benefit. Um, it's still to be seen whether the varroa mite might spread some viruses that affect them through the honeybee population that then gets into these, but they don't directly affect them. So that's um, something I won't have to worry about. What made you get serious? Um, fear. <laughs> so, you know, even then they were talking about varroa mite coming and wiping out the feral apis colonies, so any, you know, feral European honeybees were likely to disappear one day. And we've always relied on natural pollination services. Farms one third virgin bush, and then a lot of neighbouring land is too. But if anything were to happen to that, say another 2019 style fire or more clearing next door, then that could start to cause us dramas. Dr Tim Hurd agrees and says that's one of the reasons we need diversity in our pollinators. Varroa mite is a specialist parasite on honeybees. Its whole life cycle, its size, its behaviour is very much tuned in to the nesting biology of honeybees. So they can't possibly affect our native stingless bees. We're pretty confident of that because they co-occur in Asia. So the varroa mite comes from the Asian honeybee. In Asia, there's many species of native stingless bees as well, different from the ones in Australia, but very closely related. And they never get attacked by the varroa mite. Stingless bees may be safe against varroa mite, but they do come with their own issues. We do have a disease called Shanks brood disease on stingless bees. Uh, so that's a bacterial disease. And we have a lot of pests of stingless bees as well. Most of them are not particularly virulent diseases or uh, insect pests or parasites of stingless bees. But if hives are weakened or they're not kept well, if the beekeeper is not looking after them effectively, then they can wipe out native bee hives. I think we've tormented these poor little girls enough. Do you want me to help you with this one? Yeah, if you carry that one and I'll carry After this David one. split the beehive. No. Oh, there's one in my ear. And then told me that I would now Looking smell like bee want. death to the returning bees, we put the hives back in place. So I've got the original top half and it's got most of the bees in it. So this is the one that That's needs to go here. Half, so we're going to put it right where it used to be. Yep. And try and get as many of those workers back into this, this box, which yep. is a little bit short. And I'm going to put the top box right on top. Any workers that leave here will probably get confused and go back into the other half. Brilliant. Which is the one that needs more help. So yep. that'll help to balance the numbers a little bit. David has acknowledged keeping Australian native stingless bees has turned into somewhat of an obsession, albeit a healthy, productive and self-sustaining one. I've got 35 in boxes now, or 36 since we split that other one and another 24-ish logs rescued from around the place. And then there's two or three dozen trees in the bush that I know about in, on our place that can just stay there. And I'm trying to bud some new hives off of those as well. And do your native bees pollinate enough or do you need more? Oh, look, we've got great pollination already. This is my insurance policy and it doesn't hurt to have more. So we'll find the limits of the carrying capacity of this farm for bees. And even then I might start fostering some out onto uh, houses in town, friends, family, that sort of thing. Is it a viable solution for all fruit farmers worried about varroa mite? No. Sorry. <laughs> um, they only work where it's warm enough. So if you go south of Sydney, this just isn't an option. In the tropics, where it's warm enough, definitely. This is 100% could replace honeybees, provided you're worried about pollination and not honey, because we're only talking a couple of percent of the honey per hive per year.
a plan to plant millions of trees on two rundown properties near Esperance in Western Australia has attracted the attention of a global cosmetics company wanting to offset its carbon emissions. The Aboriginal corporation behind the proposal hopes the carbon credits generated by the trees will fund housing and health care for the local First Nations community, as Emily Smith reports. It's been almost a decade since the native title rights of the Esperance Wajari people were recognised, but in many ways, prospects remain limited for local Aboriginal people. The reality is that Wajari traditional owners are still a dispossessed persons because a dispossessed group because most of, of their country was taken and cleared um, to support the opening up of the agricultural um, industry in Esperance, and which is now some of the most profitable and valuable agricultural land in the country. Native title rights don't provide a way to make money off the land. So we had to look at creative ways in which we could become economically independent. That creative solution was to buy a farm. Two years ago, the Esperance Dalyarak Native Title Aboriginal Corporation teamed up with Carbon Neutral and the Odonata Foundation to buy a 4,000 hectare property north of Esperance called Carter Genup for $6.5 million. It is unusual to see um, an on-market transaction happening that results in, in First Nations ownership. The group now has big plans for the former farm. Firstly, it wants to revegetate more than 2,000 hectares of the degraded land by planting four and a half million trees. This is an expensive, difficult undertaking to do restoration at this scale. So it launched a program called the Rejuvenation Tree Project to source money for the work. International cosmetics company L'Oreal Group is one of the investors. So our uh, contribution to the Rejuvenation Trees project is a $600,000 um, financial contribution over three years. The donation is philanthropic, although they can advertise their involvement. It's about showing our consumers about the importance of bringing together the environmental and the social objectives into an amazing project like this one. Today, rangers are collecting seed to eventually replant on the property. Acacias, um, yeah, it's just easier to hit the um, plants with a tennis racket and um, they basically fall off. So when you hit them, they practically drop to wherever we've got a hessian bag uh, underneath it. Uh, so we get the seeds from out on the farm. From here, we just go down and sift the majority of all that chaff out to try to get pure seed. There's still plenty of challenges for the rangers to overcome. As far as seeding goes, yeah, the weather. Um, we have the El Nino, you know, that comes in and, and affects all Australia, really. It's getting kids to realise that um, it's not uncool to be out on land and, and planting plants or, you know, can you go a couple of hours without reception on your phones, those sort of things. The rejuvenation work will facilitate the second part of the project, carbon trading. We, we plant trees and we plant enough trees per hectare and they sequester um, carbon from, from the atmosphere, then we can generate a carbon unit. Once the trees grow big enough, they aim to sell carbon units to companies wanting to offset their emissions. Carbon offsets programs have faced scrutiny in recent years for not delivering on their environmental promises. But to tar all carbon credits and all offsets with the same brush is ultimately doing a disservice to our environment and future generations. We're not going to be able to meet our 2030 targets or address climate change without both drawing emissions out of the atmosphere and reducing emissions going into the atmosphere. And one of the best tried and tested ways of doing that is planting trees. I think investors are looking for more co-benefits these days uh, with both carbon and biodiversity outcomes, but also First Nations involvement. And this project is such an incredible example of all of those things coming together. Esperance Dalyarak says it will have requirements about who it sells carbon credits to. Dalyarak has already said no to some intensive producers of fossil fuels that we, we're not interested in a relationship. Carter Genup is one of two farms owned by Esperance Dalyarak. How far down did he go? Good enough to turn off. 
The other is three hours away at Coconera, near the site of a devastating tragedy. This property was bought um, because of its cultural heritage values. This property lies adjacent to the old uh, Dunn um, farming property where some events took place in the late 1800s and, and there was a, a massacre that resulted from that. So this holds um, special value to, to Noongar people and also it, it has really strong biodiversity values. The group also plans to revegetate parts of this property. The majority of the seeds were collected out here. We'll, once we process them, get them all ready, then we'll bring them back out and direct seed them through the tractor. Our goal is to reproduce what we can see in the distance. But ironically, as they improve the land's environmental values, they will reduce its economic ones because its suitability for agricultural production will fall. If we revegetate an area of land, then essentially it's, it's locked up and it's committed for 100 years as native revegetation. So from a commercial point of view, that land is essentially devalued to whatever the intrinsic value is of a piece of land with bush on it. Which is why at Cartagena we're sort of looking at a, a blend of um, taking out the best country, annexing that and keeping that in agriculture, and then carbon farming on the lower productivity country. It's part of the reason Esperance Dalyrac bought lower value farms to restore. We have no interest in buying good agricultural farmland for our projects. Firstly, the, the entry costs are prohibitive. Um, you know, we would never be able to pay for the cost of the property and the revegetation works on good agricultural land. The, the value is too high and it, it's not what we're about. Um, you know, like good agricultural land should probably stay good agricultural land. You know, like um, that's, that's what's, you know, producing the, the food and um, resources for the nation. We don't have any major weed issues here. People who actually understand what we're doing are, are very supportive. I think there's a general recognition that you know there needs to be probably a little bit more buffering in the system. It's probably not a healthy state to have massive areas of cleared land with um, lacking biodiversity in between. The corporation eventually hopes to use the profits from carbon trading to improve housing and healthcare. The pathway to self-determination for Aboriginal people is a challenge across the whole of Australia and we see this as a pathway for us to have um, those social determinants met um, and the outcomes of the profits from these types of programs allow us to be masters, to be able to make a choice where we put that money to change the future of our people in those social determinants which are impacting on us today. Hello, I'm Tim Lee. Still to come on Landline, we meet nature's miracle workers, worms. If we didn't have them, then uh, we wouldn't have that last part of the cycle and, as I say, it'd be a, a pretty putrid planet. Hi, I'm Kath Sullivan. Victoria has become the first state to protect dingoes on private land, claiming the animal is at risk of extinction. Dingoes are a threatened species in Victoria, but until now, landholders had been allowed to shoot, trap and poison them without a permit. The removal of what's known as an unprotection order in the state's northwest now means the species can no longer be destroyed on private land in that region. Conservation, First Nations and animal rights groups have welcomed the dingoes' newfound protection. But farmers say the latest move will lead to livestock deaths. Farmers across Victoria, the whole of Victoria, are just absolutely disgusted at this move. The state government has pledged $550,000 to help farmers with non-lethal control measures, such as guardian animals and exclusion fencing. A bid to force Coles and Woolworths to sell part of their businesses if the supermarkets were found to misuse their market dominance has been launched in the federal parliament. Under the plan proposed by the Greens and backed by the Nationals, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission would be given what's known as divestiture powers. If evidence emerges that the big chains inflated prices, exploited supply chains or acted anti-competitively, 
the watchdog could apply to the courts for the companies to be broken up and they could then be forced to sell some of their stores. There is no doubt that there's an issue around uh, market dominance enjoyed by Coles and Woolworths in the supermarket sector. There's no doubt that there are other sectors of the Australian economy that uh, corporations have too much power in and we want to redress the balance and ultimately make sure it's the interests of people that are predominant, not corporate profits. Supermarkets own 74% of the market. They are the market. And so in other comparable countries like the US and the UK, the big three in those countries control between 30 and 40% of the market. The government's ruled out the introduction of divestiture powers to lower grocery prices. Baiting for fire ants is underway in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales, from both the ground and the air. Helicopters will be used to drop the baits, which have been likened to a household pesticide. Earlier this month, the Centre of Excellence for Biosecurity told a Senate committee if fire ants were to spread, it would cost between $40 and $60 billion over three decades. A mystery illness is wiping out millions of Pacific oysters at Pipe Clay Lagoon in southern Tasmania. Farmers say over the past three years, millions of oysters have died and no one knows why. All we see is gaping oysters, open oysters, uh, uh, and it's right across the board from baby juveniles right through to mature. They say they're desperate for funding for research and licence fee relief, as some consider closing altogether. I suppose at the end of the day, I'm, I'm at the end of the tether, really, with it. I'll probably have to shut down in the next two, two or three months. Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome, or POMS, has been ruled out as the cause of the slide in oyster production. Finally today, a six-month-old baby puggle has become the first known platypus to be born in Australia's oldest national park in more than 50 years. The 850-gram female was discovered in the Hacking River in the Royal National Park, south of Sydney. She's believed to be the child of two of ten platypuses that were rehomed in the park last May. We were uh, like over the moon. It was just amazing and it, it was so rewarding and so again, like very humbling to be part of this mammoth effort. And that's Landline News. Bush poetry, long distance swimming and soap making don't appear to have much in common. But in outback New South Wales, each has proved invaluable in helping graziers deal with the pressures of isolated rural life. Broken Hill reporter Bill Ormond has the story and a warning, it mentions suicide. The dry red earth of outback New South Wales presents plenty of challenges. Scorching temperatures and rolling dust storms can test the toughest of graziers. The isolation of properties like Gum Park, northwest of Broken Hill, adds to the pressure. Weave in drought and the weight of more than 100 years of family history, and it was almost too much for Wes Herring in 2016. About 400 yards from where we sit is where I almost ended my life with a 150 grain 30-30 projectile. For Wes, the daily grind had ground him down. We were shearing, I was getting a real puzzling and I just went sheep everywhere and nothing was going to plan and it was just all getting too hard. I had the bank on me back and some other, you know, outside pressures of telling me I'm doing shit wrong and stuff and I just went, you know what, I'm over this. Sat in the wheel well of the motorbike and put the rifle under my chin. A recent report showed almost half of farmers surveyed had thoughts of self-harm or suicide, while another showed between 2009 and 2018, 370 farmer suicides were reported. For Wes Herring, coming back to the site of where it could have ended is an odd feeling. I couldn't tell you what the feeling is that you have when you stand here. I don't, it, it's not, it's not guilt. It's not pleasure as much as I like looking at the country. I don't know what it is. Wes would have left behind a loving wife and young son. But I'm not ashamed to bring people here and say this is where it almost ended. 
Years of therapy and support from family and friends helped Wes through dark periods, but it was writing poetry which empowered him the most. How could a man who has it all be so unhappy and feel so small? Wes has shared his poetry through social media as a way of breaking the stigma associated with mental health. Finding that there was no shame in it. And if I could help one person, and I said that that day, man I've become no longer suits all. I no longer stand bulletproof and tall. I've made it known. While there's been plenty of positive feedback, Wes has received pushback too. My demons have been shone under the light. I've made it public, my life's living fight. Few people withdrew out of my life because the stigma of being associated with somebody with a mental illness did not sit well in their social circles. I'm seen as ungrateful. But it hasn't deterred Wes, who's on a mission to bring awareness to the wider public about the pressures of life on the land. Black dog blues. I hope these words can save just one. I'll keep posting my words, my work's never done. Meanwhile, on a cool and cloudy morning, more than 200 kilometres west of Wes's place, one of Wes's biggest supporters prepares to take a dip. Grazier Brendan Cullen manages Car Station, which backs onto Lake Speculation, one of nine in the man-made Benindi Lake system. Brendan battled blue-green algae when he began swimming at the lakes a number of years ago, when only Kopi Hollow had water. Since then, the lakes have filled, and he's successfully swum the English Channel twice. If you're having a mundane week or a day or whatever it may be, the one thing that's going to keep pulling you out of the gutter is a good hard slog either in the pool or out in the lakes. I mean, you know, the environment that we're in at the moment is fairly special and um, lucky to have it on our doorstep and uh, it's a privilege to swim in it. And while the water here can drop to as low as 12 degrees during winter, it doesn't stop him. The freedom, you know, swimming, you know, your mind is just thinking about how you're, how you're actually swimming, uh, putting one arm in front of the other. It takes you away, away from every, you know, your everyday life skills, you know, working, you know, on the property. Not only did Brendan help Wes through tough times, he's supporting another friend in former police officer Ben Clavell. Unfortunately, um, I was diagnosed with PTSD uh, in 2019, and uh, which led to me not being able to work anymore. Um, and I was in the I was in the police for over 20 years, um, and that was a huge hit, as you as you can imagine. Go, Pete! Come on, Pete! Come on, Pete! The pair swam the English Channel together last year, and Ben has been working at Car Station since 2019. He could see that I was struggling and uh, he invited me out to cars to be uh, in nature and to, you know, just to spend some time without the noise of, of life. We have to do this once a week, twice a week, oh, haven't we? Yeah. Don't we? Brendan has battled his own demons Four dry years from 2017 to 2021, with well below average rainfall, took a toll on his mental health. I didn't realise at the time um, that I was in a depressed state, but um, I was diagnosed clinically with depression. He says the stress caused by the longevity of the last drought crept up on him. His diagnosis was a shock, but it allowed him to take a step back and assess where his life was heading. You know, for years I probably spent half my life looking behind me instead of looking in front of me and um, a lot of thoughts you were building up and I had no idea to how to get rid of them and, and to be truthful I think I was exhausted, you know, both through the drought, uh, what was going on in my head and um, in the end, you know, it wasn't uncommon when I'd go to Broken Hill and someone would say, geez, you look tired, you look exhausted. Swimming is his release, and Brendan believes it's critical to find a passion outside of work. I created a toolbox for myself, and um, from that point on, I've carried that around with me today. And if I escalate in any areas that I feel that might be pushing me down a, uh, an ordinary path, I keep reverting back to that toolbox. 
While agriculture is a male-dominated industry and men are far more likely to take their own lives, there are thousands of rural women across the country who struggle with their mental health. With the El Nino weather pattern in effect and warmer weather and less frequent rain predicted, many can't help but be stressed about what lies ahead. Would help with level ground. While Brendan uses a mental toolbox, Brit Anderson's tools are located in her workshop, crafting soaps and candles of all shapes and sizes. This is where everything happens yep. from making to uh, beveling and stamping, boxing, posting, packaging up, uh, some work on the computer, everything happens in this room. It began out of practicality, with Brit unable to use mass-produced soaps due to the chemicals in them. It's since become her release from the stresses of station life. It doesn't rely on anybody else. It doesn't rely on the weather. It doesn't rely on us being in drought or out of drought. Brit lives on Simbrick Vale Station, north of Mudawindji National Park in western New South Wales. The rocky and remote property is at least 45 minutes to the nearest neighbour. She and her husband Michael have been living here since 2008. The Anderson family has been running stock here for more than a century. During the most recent drought, they were forced to truck their sheep to South Australia, with Mick moving down to Victor Harbour to look after their stock on adjustment. And what was supposed to be temporary ended up testing Brit to her limits. So he was at the farm and I was here with the girls because there was still uh, about a thousand head here and thinking that he'd be only away for a few months and it ended up being two and a half years. The isolation of being hours from town and having to run the station on her own was a challenge. A challenge compounded when just 40 millimetres of rain fell over 18 months. It's a pretty hard place to be by yourself without that, you know, without your, your life partner there with you. Um, and, and the same for him. Recent rainfall has brought greenery back, but despite a wet El Nino in some parts of the far west, low sheep and goat prices are a concern. It feels pretty apprehensive on the agriculture side of things because there aren't a lot of options available at the moment besides sale yards and straight over the hooks. So you're really uh, completely up to the price gods, to be honest. And um, the massive drop has been a huge uh, impact on us. Brit's distraction therapy, as she calls it, not only provides her a release, but has grown as a business to where she's flying soap all over the country. Every Tuesday, the mail plane arrives with parcels before leaving with batches of soap. And while the financial side of the business is a bonus, it's the mental benefits which keep Brit in the workshop. Thank you very much. It can turn the, the day around. You know, when you've been dragging bogged sheep out of a, a dam that's about to go dry, and then you walk into that soap studio and there's the, the beautiful smells and the, the pretty soaps and all the different colours. Without it, she wouldn't be able to cope. I don't know if I could be out here without that creative outlet. I need to be able to express myself. So, and that is just a perfect way of doing it. Brit, Wes and Brendan have all found an outlet which allows them to cope through tough times. They hope by sharing their stories, it encourages more people to pick up a new hobby and speak up when they're struggling. And if it can, someone can relate to it and go, you know what, I'm not on my own. Things aren't that bad, you know, then it, it may help someone else cope with a similar situation. And I couldn't stress hard enough and long enough about trying to find something different in your life that can, you can help, you know, fill your bucket at the end of the day. It's not work related. If this story has raised issues for you or someone you know, you can call Lifeline on 13 11 14 anytime.
G'day, I'm Matt Brand, and this week I'm in Alice Springs for the NT Cattlemen's Association Conference. Around 600 people at this event, which is not a bad effort given the amount of flooding in the Northern Territory this week caused by ex-tropical cyclone Megan. Now, the NTCA has a brand new president with industry veteran Henry Burke taking over the reins from David Connolly, who has finished his three-year term. I caught up with Mr Burke earlier on and asked for his thoughts on what are the big issues facing the NT's cattle industry at the moment? Our, our upfront issues are always um, roads, you know, bushfires. We've had a big bushfire year last year and we're still working on that process to make sure that we're more prepared for it this year. We've got roads, it's a lot of damage through a big wet season that we've just had. Um, you know, we've got the uh, class action ongoing from the live export. We've got regulations on the live export stuff that we're sort of dealing with. There's a, there's a whole range of things and obviously the, the priorities keep coming up to the front and try and uh, knock them over as much as we can or particularly get decisions on that so we can move on from them basically. But some of them are ongoing forever, you know, like you've just got to keep, keep our uh, hat in the ring and keep focus on it. You mentioned the roads and the flooding. It's even raining here in Alice Springs. How would you rate the wet season this year for the Territory? Oh, it's been brilliant. It's been a really good wet start in November for a lot of the places and certainly it's kept, kept coming and um, given that we've made a lot of decisions based off uh, El Nino, so it was going to be dry or could be dry and um, a lot of decisions were made off the back of that, so being the total opposite to what that could have bought has been, been a huge relief to, to, to a lot of people. And the rain's been nearly perfect. It's not big falls until just recently. And uh, most of it's gone in and grass has grown and uh, not a lot of water run off until the last you know, month or so. So there should be plenty of green grass for Territory cattle this year. And there'll also be cotton seed for the first time because of the new cotton gin that's been built at Catherine. How important do you think that will be for the industry? It's something that we need to develop up here to, to use it in terms of the protein, you know, we're not used to using it, so therefore putting it out and making the best gains for it, yes, it certainly has a place, certainly has good protein, and we do bring it up in our feed mixes and stuff now for our supplements. So yeah, learning to use it in that space and getting, to, um, getting the best productivity from it is what we have to work on over the next 12 months that we have it. And just finally, Henry Burke, you've been a ringer, a station manager, a general manager, and now the president of the NT Cattlemen's Association. What would be your advice for younger people who are looking to forge a career in the NT's cattle industry? You know, I've, I've come through from a very early age, went, went sort of uh, working on large cattle stations and work, worked through that whole process all my life. Brought my family up through that life. It's certainly uh, been something that I've been very proud of. I think one of the things that, you know, being in the industry so long and you hear talk about the generational young ones coming through at different generations, I think one of the things I've noticed through that period is the kids that come up every year and have a go and explore their options, that hasn't changed. They, they love animals, they, uh, they love the connection, they're conscientious, they want to get out of bed and go to work. They uh, show a lot of resilience you know, in their character and they're the ones that seem to stick to the industry and keep coming back and those things haven't changed but there's certainly been other aspects of the business that changed over 40 years. So work hard, enjoy what you do and make sure you're challenged by, the, by what you're doing. Henry Burke, thanks for your time on Landline. Thank you. That's Henry Burke, who is the new president of the NT Cattlemen's Association. Territory cattle producers are having a good wet season and the live export trade to Indonesia is fairly solid. Feeder steers to Indonesia via the Darwin Port at the moment are getting around $3.50 a kilo. But in the domestic market, it was another challenging week. Despite yard numbers being well down, the tighter supply did little to improve prices, although I am told feeder steers in Queensland are selling well. A sharp drop in lamb numbers at Wagga this week helped to lift prices there, although I'm told quality is becoming an issue, with producers reluctant to grain feed lambs because the economics of doing that just aren't stacking up. A large offering of wool this week saw prices fall. In Sydney, 18 micron wool fell by 43 cents. And on the topic of fibre, I'm told cotton crops in the Northern Territory are looking pretty good, but could do 
with a little bit more blue sky. Cotton futures eased this week but are still sitting at around $660 a bale and Aussie cotton is clearly in demand. There's now a bidding war to take over Nemoy cotton with Olam Agri joining the race this week to buy Australia's largest cotton processor. Meanwhile, canola prices went up across all major port zones this week and I'm told EU certified canola is drawing a $15 to $20 premium in both Victoria and New South Wales. That is the Landline Check on prices from Alice Springs. Keep it rural. Next week on Landline, we'll take you armchair travelling in the great outdoors for a look at how our love of four-wheel driving on beaches can impact not only the environment, but rescue services as well. And we share some breathtaking pictures from workers in two remote farming worlds. The crucial role worms play in composting and soil regeneration is well understood. But increasingly, the castings, or worm juice, is finding favour in large-scale farming. Here's Landline's Tim Lee. David Davo Davidson claims to be one of Australia's largest livestock owners. Not cattle or sheep, but worms, a mostly hidden underground enterprise that sprang from a handful of horses and the need to clean up their piles of dung. Davo set out to find a natural solution and worms emerged as an obvious answer. We get the food waste, we mix it with a source of carbon, which is usually wood chips, then we put it in slabs or worm beds and then we just walk away and leave it. We don't even water it, which means that the process takes quite a lot longer, but there's far less energy consumed in the process. Today he's collecting worm castings, the end result of his work. Though it resembles ordinary soil, that's far from the case. But let's start at the beginning. Beneath the surface in this tiny corner of his farm at Broomfield in southwest Victoria is one of the most productive places on the planet. Countless millions of worms are working away below ground, and with them, countless billions of biota, microscopic microbes, pathogens and more. And this is feeding time, a daily truckload of organic waste. Without worms, I believe that the whole planet would just become a giant um, rubbish dump. These potato peelings from a giant food factory used to go to landfill. These days, the Davidson family gets paid to deal with it, and it's fending off requests to dispose of green waste from as far away as Melbourne. There's a wide variety. It's mainly waste from food production, but it's also broken down or wood chips from demolition, old wooden buildings that are seen their best days and so that's chipped up and, and comes here but there's always surprises a, a few years ago we got a phone call that a truck carrying a, a, a load of Wendy's donuts had broken down on the highway. Worms will eat anything that was once living so they're, they're very adaptable. These compost worms also have another advantage over conventional compost making methods far less energy is expended. Everything that comes onto this property was destined for landfill. And one of the beauties of having the worms do the decomposing, it overcomes the problem that normal composters have, that they don't want contamination in their food stuff. So, so plastics and plas linings and all that sort of stuff is annoyance to, to them, but the worms will get in amongst it all, eat all the organic matter, and we finish up once the, we've got dry worm castings, we've got dry plastic that quite easy to pull out and uh, remove from the, the waste. To get the optimal product takes some time. Usually between two and three years, depending on how wet the seasons are. If we have a dry spell, the whole system just slows down, but that's no big deal. Then we get the moisture, everything fires up, and away we go, and eventually we just test it after a while and find that it's a finished product. Namely, worm castings, or plainly speaking, worm poo, which Davo packages up 
in 20 litre boxes and sends out around the country with instructions on how to rehydrate and activate the microorganisms. Then apply it to soil or crops as worm juice or worm tea. One box is enough to treat 24 hectares and promote worms and beneficial microorganisms. These days the Davidson's farm with its worm enriched soils stays green for far longer than most. The animals are healthier and the land doesn't need a regular spray of this stuff. The great pioneering naturalist Charles Darwin described worms as nature's miracle workers. In fact, he was so impressed and obsessed by them that he studied them for 40 years and he even wrote a book about them. Darwin knew this much at least. Things grow and then they die but the worms and the microbes that they produce then decompose the dead matter, whether it's plants, humans, whatever, animals, and uh, turn it back into soil so they complete the cycle. And if we didn't have them, then uh, we wouldn't have that last part of the cycle and, as I say, it'd be a, a pretty putrid planet. These days, science can explain what Darwin was desperate to discover, what worms actually do. They break the material down so that the bacteria and the fungi and the nematodes, those smaller, or the um, protozoa, are able to then take that organic matter and release the elements back into elemental form, which are plant available. This is what life on Earth is about. Dr Mary Cole is a soil microbiologist and plant pathologist. During a career spanning more than half a century, She's analysed countless soil samples. These are beneficial bugs. It's estimated a teaspoon of castings contains some 8 billion microorganisms. It's Mother Nature's perfect gift to plants. Mother Nature's been recycling nutrients from everything that once lived. Years ago, Russell Calder's health collapsed so badly that for a while he lost the power of speech. I picked up a book by Bill Mollison 24 years ago or thereabouts and um, I, re I read the book and um, permaculture seemed like the right way for me and so that's what got me started. Started making compost and experimenting with different types of worms, even ventured into bait worms for there for a little while and been playing around with composts and worms and soils and such ever since and I've been just really interested in plants, been growing plants since I was probably six or eight years old. Over two decades, he has turned a barren, treeless block at Nia West in Victoria's Mallee into a green oasis and developed a burgeoning worm tea making operation. Within these rows of compost, cow manure from sale yards and feedlots and green waste, there are billions of microorganisms and countless worms at work, breaking it down. They are in such great numbers, that's what causes the compost to heat. And then, then once the compost has gone through its process, which is rather involved, it takes about three months to make a good compost. While adhering to stringent national organic standards, over two decades, Russell says he's now got the recipe right. The liquid worm castings, or worm tea. Swan Hill grain and cereal grower, Ross Watson, has closely followed its journey. The liquid's got richer and darker, just to the eye, and I believe it's a better product. Like, it's, it's got stronger. So, Russell, there should be what, quite a lot of action under the surface here. Yes, there should be a, a lot of compost worms right here. Let's take a look. So, as you can see, Tim, a lot of worms there. Russell, there are just absolutely countless worms here. Yes, huge numbers of worms, and there's be actually billions of them in these two worm beds. They can multiply double in number every 30 to 60 days. And these worm castings are the most wonderful compound. They are. They're, they're, it's Mother Nature's ultimate um, plant food, I suppose, and, and the worms are Mother Nature's ultimate recyclers, and that's what they've been doing for 450 billion years. Been recycling organic matter in recycling it into nutrients for the next generation. This magic, odourless liquid oozes from these long rows of worm castings into underground tanks. Then it's dispensed to customers in 1,000 litre containers. 
Russell's permaculture business is a family affair. Two of his kids, including son Paul, work here. It's attracting new customers through word of mouth, and the operation is set to double in size. This nutrient-rich worm juice is also finding increasing favour for broadacre crops. Initially, Ross Watson tried it because it was cheaper than using chemicals. I was aware of the costs, and if I could find an alternative that was doing as good a job. Now he soaks his seed in it at sowing time and has observed there's less insect damage in his crops. So instead of putting chemical on my seed treatment, I'll, I'll just use stimulant. And I'm convinced that it's giving more vigour to the plant and it makes me feel good because I'm not using a, a chemical that I don't understand. Another broadacre user is the Edwards family, seen here on Landline a few years back. They go biodynamic cereal crops at Murrayville in Victoria's Mallee. The Edwards farm has expanded to more than 2,000 hectares in recent years. Their grain fetches premium prices, and the family credits much of its success to spraying emerging crops with worm-derived fertiliser. Organic vegetable grower Adam Farley is also upping its use in his business. The last sort of two to three years, it's a staple part of our farm fertigation. And even um, this year, we're going to look at maybe dipping plants into a solution to give it a better start. This region can experience summer temperatures into the 40s. Adam believes worm juice rebalances and regenerates soil and even helps beat the heat. I look at the crops in three different growth stages, so baby being the first. So we use compost and composted manures to start our plant's life on the ground. So the stimulator comes in and helps the uptake of that fertiliser for the plants to put down its roots and start its life. Then from there into your teenage stage, it's all about bulking the plant up. And once again, we're putting more fertiliser on as it goes and it facilitates uptake, helps the strength of the plant. And then when we go through to the adult, we're looking at the harvesting of the plant, or especially a broccoli head or a zucchini. We're really finding it's helping with the quality and even heat stress in the summertime. The plants won't flag, the, the better water uptake. So I think all in all, it's facilitating from the ground through to the plants, just a healthier plant in general. So why isn't it more widely used? Agricultural companies, agronomists universities that don't teach soil microbiology in their agricultural courses. And so you have agronomists coming out that have been raised in a chemical paradigm. You have chemical companies who will offer free agronomists if you stop using organic methods. There's money, it's, it's, it's economics. It's nothing to do with saving the planet. They don't care, it's money. Adam Farley can only go by what he sees. We're finding worms. And I think every farmer strives for worms in the ground, and it can be a pretty hard up thing to say you got them, but we can put a shovel in the ground and find worms every time. Our understanding and recognition of these miracle workers is ever growing. Mary Cole says worms can play a vital role in saving the planet, but she warns we have to change our ways. With the globe, climate, warming, etc., we're past the point of no return. We have to start looking after what agricultural soil we have left, and we have to improve on it, and we can do it rapidly. Nature is very forgiving, and so we can turn soil around in a couple of years. We have to start doing it now. And that's the show for today. If you've missed any or just can't get enough of Landline, we're on iView. I'll leave you with the weekly weather update. Bye for now. G'day from the Bureau. Here's the weekly weather wrap up from Sunday, March 24th. In the past 24 hours, cloud can be seen streaming across northern and central Australia. Within this cloud band, showers and the odd thunderstorm for much of the Northern Territory and Queensland, with persistent falls around parts of the tropics. Elsewhere, cool, dry weather is in place and it's expected to stay that way throughout Sunday. The north-south divide in the weather forecast continues on Monday. Throughout the Northern Territory, Queensland and far northern WA, showers are common. 
and there's a chance that severe thunderstorms may bring localised areas of heavy rain. Very cold temperatures will continue about the southern NT. In contrast, the southern states have dry weather with light winds due to these high pressure areas. There is an exception to this with strong gusty winds for Tasmania and showers to the west and interior of the state. The high pressure areas are slow moving so not a lot of change expected for Tuesday. A few light showers possible in the southeast but only a couple of millimetres at most so no sign yet of the autumn break. Queensland and the Northern Territory are again the focal point for shower and storm activity. Dry weather continues for many into Wednesday and it will start to warm once again for southern WA. Foggy mornings possible for many. Coastal showers for New South Wales to join the Territory and Queensland as the wet spots. Little to no significant change forecast for Thursday. The unfortunate news is that the few places which are likely to get rain are some of the same northern areas which have experienced flooding in recent weeks and months, although rainfall this week is lighter so it is not expected to have the same flood impact. And the week will finish much like it began, with scant rainfall chance for anyone in the southern states. New high pressure areas building to the west of Australia suggests this pattern may last out beyond the end of the week as well. That's all for this week, we'll catch you again next time.